Thursday, June 23rd, and this is your Coffee Break on the HAN Network. I'm Rob Adams in for Kate Chaplinski. Kate will be back Monday. Donald Eng standing over at the sports desk. He is in for me. We'll have weather and we'll also have the front pages as it is front page Thursday. As we go through the headlines of this Thursday, June 23rd. Let's start the headlines now. All five of Connecticut's representatives in Congress joined fellow Democrats in a sit-in on the U.S. House floor to demand votes on gun control legislation before the Independence Day break. But House Republicans ended the revolt led by Connecticut Democrat John Larson and civil rights icon Representative John Lewis of Georgia by adjourning in the middle of the night for the long July 4th break. And... While the C-SPAN cameras were turned off, the Democrats on the floor were using Twitter to post many of these photos that we're showing to you right now. Larson and a group of about 20 Democrats, including Fairfield County's Congressman Jim Himes, took control of the chamber late Wednesday morning and said they would not relinquish it until GOP House leaders allowed votes on gun safety legislation. But it did not sway House Speaker Paul Ryan, who called the Democratic sit-in a publicity stunt. He scheduled key votes on bills that would fund the U.S. response to the Zika virus and military construction next year for 2.30 in the morning, then adjourned to the House for the holiday two days before it was scheduled. The move angered the protesting Democrats who shouted, coward, shame, shame, and continued their chant of no bill, no break. Said Representative Rosa DeLauro of New Haven, they cut short the session by two days because they didn't want to give us a vote. That's a quote. The Democrats vowed to start their protest all over again when the House reconvenes on July 5th. The Democrats were demanding a vote on the terror gap bill. They also were seeking a vote on a bill that would extend FBI, FBI background checks to gun shows and individuals selling firearms over the Internet. Representative Larson said, give us a vote, just like Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell gave the Senate a vote. You have the opportunity to let America know where you stand. The sit-in came a week after Connecticut Senator Chris Murphy led a filibuster of nearly 15 hours to pressure Senate GOP leaders to hold votes on gun control. The measures failed to win 60 votes needed for approval, but opened the door to further debate and a possible compromise in the Senate. Many Trumbull residents are asking who installed a new curb in the road blocking the Main Street entrance to Broadway Road. The curb, seen here, protrudes into Main Street beside Long Hill Green. It requires cars to drive into the oncoming traffic lane to enter Broadway. One resident reported three near collisions at the intersection in the past two days, but town officials say the curb has been planned for five years and is required to fulfill a safety requirement of the property owner. More than five years ago, the Police Commission State Department of Transportation approved the traffic changes. But it seems no one noticed the public, something that Trumbull PNZ Chairman Fred Garrity Jr. conceded to the Trumbull Times this week. No one notified the public, he said. Besides a sign that sits in front of the curb and reads, no through traffic after June 20th to alert drivers, there hasn't been any notification about what has been created on the road. Garrity said that based on the state definition, the road is a no through street. Hence the sign. In a quote, but what's really been created is a faux dead end from both directions, he said. You can, meet, you can read more about this at TrumbullTimes.com. The Bridgeport Board of Education is looking to cut $850,000 from its 2016-17 budget and is seeking to eliminate all school resource officer positions to cover about half of that expense, according to the Connecticut Post. The Bridgeport School District currently employs 82 security guards and five resource officers. Eliminating the five resource officer positions would reportedly account for 492,000 of the proposed cuts. According to the report, the Board of Education's reasoning for eliminating the positions is that police have to protect the schools anyway, so resource officers shouldn't be something bankrolled from already scarce school funding dollars. That's a quote. In addition, school board members have claimed 
The resource officers were seen sitting in their police cars for much of the day and even leaving school grounds to attend to other police business. One school resource officer is stationed at the city hall annex rather than at a school, leading school board members to question why the district is paying for them. Bridgeport City Council members reportedly responded to the proposed cuts in an unsigned email calling the cuts negligent and reckless. The email concluded saying cutting the positions would pose a safety risk, saying whoever thought Columbine or Newtown would ever happen, don't let Bridgeport be next. That's a quote. To Stratford now, police are looking for a group of men as part of an investigation into a stolen wallet. Police said yesterday that the wallet was accidentally left on the counter of the Easy Stop convenience store at 3355 Main Street between 6 and 6.30 on Sunday. Police said that a male in a tank top was seen on video taking the wallet and placing it in his pocket and leaving. The wallet contained various identification and approximately $500 in cash. Anyone who has information as to the identities of the men is asked to contact Stratford Police at 203-385-4100. You can visit stratfordstar.com for more on this story. Shelton Police chased down a car that had been stolen at gunpoint on Wednesday and arrested two young men for the theft. 20-year-old Dion Lovett of Waterbury and an unnamed 17-year-old were charged with first-degree larceny. Yesterday, about 4 p.m., a Shelton police detective saw Lovett and the teen in downtown Shelton in a Chrysler van with the rear door wide open. When the detective attempted to stop the vehicle, it sped off and a pursuit ensued. The pursuit concluded on Route 34 in Derby, where Lovett eventually stopped in. In the vehicle were four other juveniles. A police investigation found that the van was stolen at gunpoint in New Haven on June 12th. Along with the larceny charges, Lovett was charged with engaging per police in pursuit and three counts of risk of injury to a minor. No other arrests are expected in the case, according to police. Turning to your forecast now, a slight chance of showers with thunderstorms also possible this afternoon, mostly cloudy and a high near 81. The wind out of the southeast around 6 miles per hour. Mostly cloudy during the evening tonight, then gradual clearing with a low around 58. The wind will die down to between 3 and 6 from the northwest. Sunny and 81 for Friday. Friday night mostly clear and 59 for the low. Saturday, sunny and 82 with a calm wind. To Saturday night mostly clear and 60. Sunny and 84 for Sunday. Mostly sunny and 83 for Monday. With a 30% chance of showers both Tuesday and Wednesday, but highs in the low 80s. In Monroe right now, it's 73. Fairfield has 74, and here in Shelton, 74 degrees. We'll take a break. Don's got history and sports, and we have more headlines along with front pages right after this on the HAN Network. Connecticut is coming back to hometown banking, to a partner that makes small businesses feel big, where community comes first, where you get the know-how only neighbors can deliver, where saving time is important too, it's time to expect more. It's time to bank well. Bank smart. Bank local. Bank well. With the 24-month Bank Well Smart CD, you can earn 1.35% APY and raise your rate and add to your CD. Have a sports injury or a slip and fall that needs immediate care? Coastal Ortho Express Urgent Care gives you direct access to an orthopedic specialist fast, without an appointment. Biking, golf, tennis, soccer, whatever the sports injury is, sprain or fracture, Coastal Ortho Express can help. Coastal Ortho Express Urgent Care, open Monday through Saturday, now in two locations. The I Park Building at 761 Main Avenue in Norwalk and 36 Old Kings Highway South in Darien. Or go to CoastalOrthoExpress.com, like them on Facebook.
Keep your future star active and happy this summer at Future Star Sports Academy camps and clinics. The Academy is offering sessions throughout Fairfield County. Sign up for a week of basketball, cheerleading, football, or a multi-sports camp. At Future Stars Academy, children learn the fundamentals while under the supervision of qualified coaches. And what sets the Academy apart is its special Lessons of Life sessions, teaching values and focusing on building self-esteem, friendships, and honesty. Located at Sports Center Connecticut in Shelton and in Sports and Trumbull. Register online at futurestarsportsacademy.com. You're watching the HAN Network, and you're not alone. Nearly one million people have watched our live sports, news, and entertainment programming since the network launched in August 2015. Advertise on the network that reaches Fairfield County, Connecticut's most engaged audience. Contact Advertising Director Jessica Murren at 203-273-7312 or email jessica at han.network. Welcome back to your coffee break. This Thursday morning, I'm Rob Adamson for Kate Chaplinski. And it is time to take a look at history with a guy who will have an historic camp out this weekend, but that's a conversation for another time. <laughs> Donald Ang, good morning. Well, good morning, John. You know, uh, sometimes something finally stuck to Teflon a few years ago, but first we're going to go to 1314, the Battle of Bannockburn. Uh, that, that if, you're, if you remember, that was the end of Braveheart. The battle ended the First War of Scottish Independence, but didn't secure Scotland's freedom for as long as Mel Gibson might have implied. The English didn't recognize Scottish independence until 1328, and within four years, the Second War of Scottish Independence had begun. That 23-year conflict actually did secure Scottish independence until the kingdoms of Scotland and England merged to form Great Britain in 1707. To 1972, Title IX of the U.S. Civil Rights Act of 1964 is amended to prohibit sexual discrimination to any educational program receiving federal funds. It's best known for its role in creating and expanded, expanding women's athletics, but Title IX actually covers all educational activities, prohibiting discrimination in things like science or math curriculum and non-sports activities like the school band and other clubs, social fraternities and sororities, and gender-specific youth clubs like the Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts are specifically exempted. 1982, Chinese-American Vincent Chin dies after being beaten with a baseball bat in Highland Park, Michigan by two auto workers who had mistaken him for Japanese and who were angry about the success of J Japanese car companies. The two perpetrators initially faced second-degree murder charges but were convicted in a county court of manslaughter and given three years probation. Subsequent federal prosecution was the result of public pressure from a coalition of Asian ethnic organizations. The murder is considered the beginning of the pan-ethnic Asian American community. And finally, now we go to 1992. Speaking of reactions from ethnic communities, for this. The crime boss, John Gotti, has been sentenced to life in prison with no parole. Gotti was said to be the most powerful crime figure in America. He was certainly the most visible and the most flamboyant. And he used to have a reputation for being untouchable. Here's ABC's Jim Hickey. Why do I he was he rigged, has... right? He was rigged. The is government may consider you? Gotti a dangerous is mobster, right? but to people from his neighborhood, bail. he is a hero. Bail. That's a hostage. You can no and bail. those jurors were biased. Equal rights! Equal rights! Several hundred of them stormed the Brooklyn courthouse where the convicted crime boss had just been sentenced. Inside, federal marshals locked the doors against the angry protesters. The crowd then attacked cars belonging to the marshals. I feel they had a very rotten trial, an unfair trial. This is worse than Russia. Gotti himself stood quietly and made no comment as District Judge Leo Glasser pronounced the life sentence. Would you like to say anything, the judge asked. Gotti shook his head, no. Yes, that, of course, John Gotti, sentenced on this day in 1992 to life in prison without possibility of parole. One of the most powerful and dangerous crime bosses in America, his outspoken personality and flamboyant style gave him the nickname the Dapper Don for his expensive clothes and his habit of uh, being flamboyant in front of news cameras. He was later given the nickname the Teflon Don after three trials in the 1980s resulted in his acquittal, although it was later revealed that the trials had been tainted by widespread jury tampering, juror misconduct, and witness intimidation. He was finally convicted and sentenced on this day, 1992. This place is worse than Russia. <laughs> <laughs> With your look back in history, I'm Donald Ng. Now, the question is, you're a Don. Are you Teflon? We're going right back to you for sports anyway. Oh, no, 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 not at all. Although, uh, <laughs> although apparently, uh, I, I, am, I am exempted from these, some of the, you know, the, the 
you know, name pronunciation rules, but we're, gonna, we're working on that. <laughs> Take it away. We're starting with the American Legion Baseball in the 19 and under division. Trumbull, 15 to 2 over Westport. Jared Rosen went the distance, allowing three hits, walking none, striking out five. Trumbull had 13 hits and scored six runs in the second inning, five more in the fourth, four in the fifth. Among the highlights of that six run second inning, Brian Natick. And uh, had a two uh, with Brian Natick and a two RBI single for Tyler Zacchaeus. Other scores: Norwalk five to four over Ridgefield, Wilton two, Darian New Canaan one, Stamford nine, Fairfield two. In the 17 and under division, Greenwich 18 to nothing over Bridgeport, Wilton six, the Darian New Canaan team three. On the schedule for today: Wilton at Darian New Canaan. Bridgeport at Greenwich, Ridgefield at Norwalk, Fairfield at Stamford, that game at Cubetta Stadium, Westport at Trumbull. For the 17s, Greenwich at Bridgeport, Stamford at Fairfield, and Darian New Canaan at Wilton. Uh, moving on to Danbury, the North Adams Steeplecats built up a 12 to 1 lead after five and a half innings at Rogers Park in Danbury, but the Danbury Westerners made them sweat it a bit. The Westerners scored nine runs in the sixth, seventh, and eighth before falling 12 to 10. The Westerners actually had the tying run at the plate in the bottom of the ninth, but couldn't finish the comeback. Ryan Nelson, a Quinnipiac student, homered twice for Danbury. The Westerners host Newport tonight. In the Atlantic League, the, uh, the Bridgeport Bluefish scored on a fielder's choice in the bottom of the seventh to take a 7-6 decision over the Lancaster Barnstormers. They're back in action again tonight, opening a three-game set with the Long Island Ducks at the ballpark at Harbor Yard. The New Britain Bees put up singles in the first, second, and third innings to beat Somerset 3-0. James Skelton homered twice. Kyle Simmon went the distance on a two-hitter. The Bees head to the road uh, to uh, take on Lancaster. The Hartford Yard Goats got three in the seventh and two more in the eighth to top the Richmond Flying Squirrels 7-6 last night in New Hampshire. Roselle Herrera homered twice for the Goats. The two teams will play again today in a matinee. And the Connecticut Tigers improved to 4-2 and two on the young season in the New York Penn League with a 7-5 home win over the Brooklyn Cyclones. They also will play again tonight at Dodd Stadium, and in Stratford, the Briquettes back in action, opening an eight-game homestand. First up, a doubleheader with the Connecticut Seahawks tonight. All right, that is your look at sports. Rob. You know, you got to love some of these names. Now, uh, Connecticut Tigers, that's fine. Then You can still go with the standards, nothing wrong with that. But the Flying Squirrels, the Yard Goats, I mean, they've stepped up their game in this day and age. They really have stepped up their game. And also, you know, and, and look at them, the, the Brooklyn Cyclones, you know, kind of like hearkening to that, uh, to that, that historic, um, his, that, that's historic. You know, um, yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, it, it's, it's fun to see. And also, it makes for great uh, ball cap souvenirs. I was going to say, that's a key, you know, to quote Spaceballs, merchandising. <laughs> <laughs> That's a crucial part of it, Don. Thanks very much for that check on sports as we return to some more headlines now. And a Stanford dental practice owner has been accused of using the records of a retired dentist from the same office to bill insurance companies for more than 10 years for work that was never performed. 43-year-old Elena Ilyazrov of Stanford has been charged with wire fraud for billing more than $1.1 million in fraudulent charges, according to Dear Jadali, U.S. Attorney for the District of Connecticut. Ilyazrov, who faces up to 20 years in jail if convicted, was released Tuesday after posting a $500,000 court appearance bond. According to the federal complaint, she fraudulently obtained the retired dentist records starting in 2005 and used the information to bill insurance companies through the practice, Advanced Dentistry, which has an office at 999 Summer Street. An unprecedented nationwide sweep led by the Medicare Fraud Strike Force in 36 federal districts resulted in criminal and civil charges against 300 people, including 61 doctors, nurses, and other licensed medical professionals for schemes that resulted in $900 million in false billings. U.S. Attorney General Loretta Lynch said that on Wednesday. The Western Board of Finance cut nearly a half million dollars from its school capital and operating budgets to offset the more than $460,000 in losses in revenue from Weston's share of the educational cost sharing grant, which was cut by the state. The Finance Board's cuts were approved by the Board of Education and include reductions to both the school capital budget and operating budget. 
These cuts will put off capital projects such as insulating, installing air conditioning at Hurlbut Elementary School and in the middle school orchestra room. It also cut operating budget money by eliminating two part-time groundskeepers, updating the school website, thousands in school supplies, and much more. You can get all the details at thewesternforum.com. Milford neighbors of a proposed nine-unit housing complex with three affordable units at 214-224 Seaside Avenue faced off again with the project developer in a public hearing before the City Planning and Zoning Board at City Hall. About 30 residents attended the, the Tuesday night hearing with six speaking in opposition voicing the same concerns for the revised plans that they expressed at the March 1 public hearing for the original proposal. The board closed the public hearing and will likely discuss and vote on the proposal at its July 5th meeting at City Hall. The project needs a special permit, coastal management site plan review approval, and site plan review approval as well. In the new plans, the house at 224 Seaside Avenue would be demolished. The two garages originally planned for 214 Seaside would instead be located at 224 Seaside Avenue. A single-family cottage would be built at 214 Seaside, along with the seven cottages originally proposed for the rear of the property. The existing house at 214 Seaside Avenue would remain. Read more all about that in today's Milford Mirror or at MilfordMirror.com. Stratford residents opposed to a proposed affordable housing development on James Farm Road streamed before the town zoning commission to say the development is not the right fit for the neighborhood. During this week's special meeting, which lasted nearly three hours, residents told the commission why they believe the plan by 500 North Avenue LLC to build a 72-unit complex at 70, 795 James Farm Road should be stopped. The development group, which includes Nicholas Owen, wants, to, wants approval to build the homes using the state's affordable housing statute. The company also wants commissioners to approve the creation of the new Julia Ridge Housing Opportunity Development Zone, which would allow 500 North Avenue to build as needed. Residents who spoke to the commission said they feel the proposal is incomplete, adds too much traffic to the roads, and possibly negatively affects groundwater and neighbors' wells. Read more about this affordable housing battle in today's Stratford Star or at stratfordstar.com. We will take a break. John Kovach needs to join me right here as we'll talk about the front pages. We'll do that right after this on your Coffee Break on the HAN Network. I really wanted something that felt like a home. Coming from a big house, I wanted the feel of a home as opposed to a condo. The construction is incredible, whether it's the floors, the fireplace, the moldings, the lighting. It's as peaceful as my home was in the middle of the woods. It feels like a house. It does not feel like a condo or a townhome. I feel like I'm in my house. Walter Stewart's Market in New Canaan is your time-saving local shopping destination for the best of spring. Find many of your favorite products, from great specials on everyday items to the freshest organic produce, artisanal cheeses, and grass-fed steaks. Drop off your knives to be sharpened, grab a beautiful bouquet of spring flowers, and stop in next door for a wine tasting. Plus, their personal staff is always ready to lend a helping hand. So stop in to Walter Stewart's Market, 229 Elm Street, today, or shop online at stewartsmarket.com. Mosquitoes, ticks, gone. Guaranteed. That's what Mosquito Squad guarantees as America's most trusted mosquito and tick control company. Locally owned and operated, over 90,000 homes have been protected by Mosquito Squad using their dual protection method for season-long protection, which includes barrier spray service for eliminating mosquitoes and adult ticks, as well as supplemental programs to increase tick control. They use only USDA organic options, which are safe and non-toxic. Contact them today at www.squadctny.com or 203-893-4309. Mosquito Squad. No bugs, no bites, no kidding. When it comes to local entertainment, we've got it all. From movies, local artists, etiquette, and more. Watch HAN Arts and Leisure every Thursday at 2 on the HAN Network. I'm Denise DiGregoli, the host of The Drive on the HAN Network. 
Join me Tuesdays for some motivational, intelligent talk with a little humor as we visit with people who live their lives mindfully. Tune in to The Drive Live on Tuesdays, 1230, here on the HAN Network. I'm John Kovach. I'm a newspaper editor. I'm a high school football coach. I'm a television presenter. And I want you to love fishing as much as I do. Tune in to Yankee Fisherman, Thursdays at 1 on the HAN Network. It's like going to the tackle shop without leaving your office. Welcome back to your Thursday coffee break on the HAN Network. I am joined now by some guy standing here to my left, your right, John Kovach. I'm never on your left, even when we do games. You were never on my left? Very rarely. Very rarely. I used to be on the right. Interesting. Well, then this is a switch up, yeah. and it's front page Thursday. Front page Thursday. You want to kick things off? I will start in Weston with just a great photo of an owl that was rehabilitated, great horned owl taking flight. Uh, love the headline, amended wing and a prayer, and just a, one of those very cool stories about wildlife rehabilitation. Uh, school budget cuts made by the Board of Finance there in Weston's, uh, and a discussion of the future of Connecticut with the legislators who represent Weston up in Hartford. What do you got? I have the Trumbull Times and 542 students have taken flight from, of course, the Trumbull Eagles from Trumbull High School. I like the lead on it by Steve Coulter. A world of possibilities is now one degree hotter. Just two of the messages from those 542 students. And Congratulations sticking. to all of them. Sorry about that. That's Rob. okay. Sticking with the graduation theme, the Stratford Star with two graduations. Stratford always does Bunnell and Stratford's the same time on the same night, which really makes life easy for your Stratford Star editor. But uh, yeah, it, good coverage, and it, it's an exciting time of year for these kids. Also, a feature on Henry Radomski, who for 46 years has been a swimming instructor at the Stratford YMCA. Very nice. I am taking a look at Mr. Monroe Courier himself, Donald Eng, that is. And to turn serious, you know, it's been a, a tough couple of days in Monroe. In this case, uh, the second fatal motorcycle crash in five days, this time on Route 110. I've driven by the memorial that has uh, sprouted up along Route 25 in Monroe. Um, obviously, sad times and, uh, you know, stories that have to be reported, unfortunately. Awful, awful stories there. Time of transition in Wilton where the class of 2016 graduated. Some photos there from Scott Mullen. But also three religious leaders announce that they are also leaving Wilton. And a very interesting story, um, two, two stories actually, two different people. There are two different Wilton uh, High graduates who have been appointed two academies, one to the Coast Guard Academy, one to the Merchant Marine Academy. That's very cool stuff there. No, oh, very cool. To Milford now from the Milford Mirror. Sad news with the uh, farewell to St. Gabe's, as you can see right there on the cover and uh, singing a special school song, I Think You're Wonderful, as students say goodbye to the school that they love, St. Gabriel School in Milford. But also the DOT updating their plans for I-95's exit 33. Uh, you know, I-95, the Connecticut Turnpike, a highway that dates back a long time now. There are places it needs updating, and that's a spot at exit 33 that needs it. Exit 33, one of those where there is a jump because they never did put it in. You know why? Tell me. So you couldn't get around the toll. That's correct. No, no such thing as shun piking in that case. Nope. Well done. Nope. Where are we going? We're going to Easton, where I found it very interesting that in 2016, for the first time, the town is appointing a finance director, and she already holds the position of tax collector. So people in Easton familiar with her. A uh, story we brought you on Coffee Break earlier in the week, the town settling uh, a discrimination lawsuit with a uh, female police officer. Discussion continuing on the future of the South Park property with Sacred Heart offering $6.7 million plus open space for that property. Uh, in my circles, a lot of concern about that because of its proximity to the Mill River. Meanwhile, discussion continues about the need for senior housing and Eastern residents traveling to Orlando with a message of love and support in the wake of the mass shooting there. 
Couple of items from the Lewisboro Ledger. Of course, congrats to the twa the class of 2016 at John Jay High School. But uh, also a Lewisboro re a native starring in a reality TV show on Fox. Lisa Rotondi uh, is uh, on the show Coupled, according to uh, the story by Jane Dove of uh, from the Lewisboro Ledger. And a note also from Jane about the Big Apple Circus, which we've heard about forever. Oh, we're, forever. We're Metro New York guys, in danger of forever folding its tent. Interesting. If you grew up in this area, you saw the Big Apple Circus ads when you traveled on the television, all of those things. Yeah. So that I found a surprise, although yeah. I don't know where the circus stands as a form of entertainment with everything going on today. It, I think the circus is in a very evolving time considering what Ringling Brothers just recently did. Right. You know, it, it's, it's an interesting time for circuses. So it's a time of transition for students as they move on from high school to college. But you don't have to be a senior to do that, as the Shelton Herald's Person of the Week shows us, where a sophomore from Shelton High School... Carly Bryant will be going off to college. Interesting story there. Uh, American Idol winner Nick Fradiani performing in Shelton. Uh, the town mourning Tim Walsh, a sports fan and education system supporter who they say bled orange and black, the school's colors. And I found this one kind of interesting that two elementary schools are going to share an assistant principal. That is interesting. I don't know if I've ever heard of that arrangement uh, in an elementary school before. Nor have I. To Darianne now, to the times we go, and a story that's intriguing from Susan Schultz, the editor, writing about vaping as it's known. We've seen the e-cigarettes. Well, there's a lot more to it than simply meets the eye. And Susan breaks it all down, and you begin to discover that they're not as completely harmless as people want you to believe. The e-cigarette is not a completely harmless uh, form of, you know, smoking, if you will. No, we're learning as, as we go along with those. Absolutely true. Lights continue to be a big story. Dan Arestia, the fine reporter for the Times, writes about that. We know that, you know, Darien High School, one of the few that doesn't have lights for its football field, so that continues to be a big topic. And Kevin Webb writing about the potential changes going on on the uh, Corbin Drive property from Baywater Properties. We'll see if they uh, are able to get that off the ground. If you get a chance to look at the Times and see that, that photo it's it's such a, a radical change not not in a bad way right uh, though it will be fairly tall I mean they're talking about a fairly large building there but uh, very interesting to see if those go through and that's a look at it in uh, the lower right corner there on your screen right now John in Ridgefield graduations continues as the brilliant sonnet of the future calls the Ridgefield High School class of 2016 uh, questions being raised about an outdoor theater at the Cultural Center at the Schlumberger property and uh, taking a look at politics where State Rep John Frey says that Trump was not his first, second, or third choice, but as a superdelegate, he has a ballot and has to vote for whoever the majority chose, so he will be, it appears, casting that ballot for Donald Trump. Over to New Canaan we go now, and 281 graduate at Dunning Field, and there are great pictures from Dave Stewart. He was showing them to me yesterday. He has one shot, and I believe it's in the paper, along with a, a picture of our, our very own Ellie Hersom, who we know so well, but uh, a great shot of a student uh, standing, and then on the same image on the uh, screen behind them, of course, on that Dunning uh, Stadium video screen. So great shots from Dave, as always. Rich Durazo writing the story for the New Canaan an advertiser and uh, Greg Riley also writing about now even evenly split on first selectman finance issue and councilman speaking up Rob Malazzi having his say on various issues that gonna be interesting to see where that falls out because that's been debated for a very long time charter revision has uh, been quite a topic of late around the NCA just taking a look inside the papers don't forget the arts and leisure section we've got HAN arts and leisure coming up today at 2 uh, two Ridgefield landmarks whose history is in twine, and that's a story on the Keeler tab Tavern and the Gilbert Fountain, and cooling off with soup. 
which you wouldn't think about. You wouldn't think about Not it. Soup any time of the year. But that fountain at the corner of 35 and 33, so iconic to Ridgefield for yes. sure. Last but not least, the Reading pilot is heard from today. Chris Burns writing about the uh, successful work uh, from Reddingites to pass common sense law. And look, we all need some common sense in our lives, don't we? Just remember, common sense law is when you agree with who you're talking to. That's exactly right. <laughs> and uh, a Region 9, from the Region 9 Board of Education, a French trip. Always cool to talk about traveling. We. We, we indeed. I don't know. Sounds right. Yeah, well. Well played by you. Thank you. <laughs> and a nice job of remembering uh, Joan Enzer, who, quote, lived the life she wanted. We had a story about her yesterday here on Coffee Break. And a uh, nice lady who was 103 years old, passed away, but also, you know, a member of the fraternity that you and I are a part of, a journalist as well. And left a mark on Reading and a legacy. Absolutely true. So there are all your newspapers and your front pages for this Thursday around the HAN network. There we go, busy Thursday. Busy Thursday, what's coming up on your side of the world? We had the pleasure of interviewing Chris Fisher. Uh, Chris started doing fishing shows and it evolved into the nonprofit O-Search. Uh, it's been publicized on television shows such as Shark Men and Shark Wranglers where they're using this unique method they came up with to catch sharks, tag them and do testing on them, release them and then track them, the effort being to rebuild the population and protect these sharks that are so crucial to the oceans and thus the planet. They're going to be working right in our backyard this summer. And promote it again. What time? One o'clock. There you go. Not long after John says goodbye with Yankee Fisherman. Arts and Leisure later today with Sally and Steve. So. Another busy Thursday, and then right back into uh, here tomorrow for one final coffee break for the week. There we go. Thanks for coming out today. No worries. Thanks to Don for keeping us company over there. For Andrew and Eric on the other side. For all of them, I'm Rob Adams. Enjoy Yankee Fisherman and Arts and Leisure later today. Beautiful day right now. Chance of thunderstorms, temperatures in the upper 70s. Have a great day, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow.